Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And I pray this morning that the words I speak glorify you, that the meditations of my heart are acceptable in your sight, so that we know you evermore and love you evermore. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I uh, have a question or two for you. Can you be a Christian if you don't have a lot of money? Yeah, right? Can you be a Christian if you have a lot of money? Yeah, okay. Can you be a Christian if you haven't graduated from high school? Okay. Can you be a Christian if you have uh, several PhDs? Yeah, right? I mean, these questions seem kind of silly, don't they? We rightly say, well, of course you can be a Christian. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how much uh, education or lack of education, right? None of that matters. But now let me ask you another question. Can you be a Christian and not have love? So it's a different question, isn't it? And it's a question that should ultimately give us a little pause, right? And you rightly said no, because being a Christian, love is essential to being a Christian, isn't it? Love is an essential aspect of being a disciple of Jesus. To say that you know Jesus but don't love him is the same as saying that you don't know him. To say that you know Jesus but don't love one another is to also say you don't know Jesus. See, if you take love out of being a Christian, you take Christ out of your life. So this morning we're going to take a look at essential love. Now, I did a, a title for the sermon, uh, Essentials. It's not a series per se. I just want to let you know that. I, I generally do series, uh, but right now, between now and Advent, it's going to be pretty choppy. Next week, I think I'll do one other essential, but then we get into Reformation Sunday and so forth. So I'm going to use this kind of as a touchstone and occasionally come back to it as needed. Now, this morning, we're going to focus on the essential love. And we're going to focus from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It is one that is often read and used in weddings, right? You've, you've heard it at weddings many times. Did you know it actually wasn't written for a wedding? I don't know if you knew that, but it was actually written for a church, for a body of believers. So there's a lot that we can learn from this particular section. And this morning, four aspects, essential love, acts of love, permanent love, and mature love. So let's go with essential love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. This was written to the church in Corinth, the Corinthians. Now, if you were here a couple of weeks ago, I talked about how church can be messy. I don't know if you remember that. Church can be very, very messy. Let me talk about the church at Corinth or the Corinthians. They were the epitome of messy. Let me give you some examples of things that were going on. There was division in the church. Some said, I follow Paul. Some said, I follow Peter. Some said, I follow Apollos. There was sexual immorality. Listen to this. This is from 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans 
for a man has his father's wife. There was also getting drunk and basically being gluttons for the Lord's Supper. People were being really wild with their use of tongues, and they were proud that they were speaking in tongues. And there were also lawsuits among each other. I mean, when there's actual lawsuits within the church, you know that love is not present. There's that phrase, no love lost. Well, when you get a lawsuit together, it's often no love lost. But Paul comes back, and he basically says, everything that you've been proud about, that you've been boasting about, all the prophecies, the speaking in tongues, the mysteries, understanding things, being so proud of yourself, if you have not love, you have nothing. It's actually very similar to what Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes. He said this, I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after the wind. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge, and applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this also is but a striving after the wind. Solomon wrote about this. Look, being a Christian without love is vanity. It's a striving after the wind. And you don't have to have a lawsuit in a church to have that happen. There are many churches that have proper doctrine, that have the proper form, that people can quote things, but there is no love. And if you've got the form without the substance... It's vanity. It's a striving after the wind. That's what I, I love of, about our church, is that people talk about that friendliness, that love that we have for one another. That's the basis, really. Love of God and love for one another. So, we are going to get in the question. So, if you say, right, if you say, well, love is essential to being a Christian, but what does that actually mean? What, what does love mean? And so we're going to get into this next section, acts of love. You all know this because you've all been to weddings. <laughs> love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoings, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now, that's a pretty long list. As a matter of fact, if you take a look at it, there are 15 attributes about love. But I want you to notice that they aren't feeling words. These are action words, things that love does. So love is an action. It's just not a thing that we describe. Let me give you kind of a silly example. If I said, I'm tired, I'd like to sit down, do you have a chair? You could say, well, yes, we do have chairs. And let me tell you about this chair. It has four legs, it has a seat, it has a back. It's actually a very, very nice chair. And you think, great, could I sit on one? There's the action of the chair, right? Not just the describing of the chair. So often in churches, there's the describing of something, but not the doing of it. Love is not just a feeling. As a matter of fact, the Bible rarely describes love as a feeling. It describes it in word, in deed, in actions. And so that's what we must think about love. So I want to focus on the first two. Love is patient and kind. Love is patient and kind. Although this translation is very appropriate, when we read these words, we don't get the full depth or sense of these particular words. 
Let's go with that first word, patient. Now, patient or patience in our culture is almost gone, isn't it? There's an old joke. How do you measure the length of a second? It's the time between the light turns green and somebody honks behind you. That's about what we have for patience nowadays in our culture. I want it fast, 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 fast. A lot of commercials are 15 seconds or less. And if you notice on commercials, they change almost every second or second and a half with an image. That's what we're geared for. But when we take a look at patience in the Bible, it is very different. To be patient is really long-suffering. It is about a love that endures suffering over time. It also ties in, by the way, with verse 7, which is love bears all things and love endures all things. Long-suffering. See, love will suffer neglect, rudeness, faithfulness, faithlessness. It will suffer mocking, resentment, even abandonment. Now, think about the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. How often have they accepted God and then fallen away or rejected God? It was a cycle over and over and over again. And thus, we are thankful that God is long-suffering. Now, it's really easy, however, to think about just the nation of Israel. Oh, that's them. But yeah, I take a look at my life. And I've done, a lot, I've done a lot of the same cycles as Israel. I'm with God, and then, yeah, you know, you know follow, you know. You. And I'm thankful that God is patient or long-suffering with me. And that's the type of patience we are to have when we love one another. Now, you might be thinking, I don't have that type of long-suffering. I don't have that enduring patience that God has. And it's true that we don't because this type of love comes from God himself. It is part of his very nature. The love that is being described here in 1 Corinthians is the highest type of love there is. And it's called agape or agape, depending on how you want to pronounce it, love. I'm going to do agape. Agape, it is the self-sacrificial love that comes from God himself. That's what we mean when we're talking about love is long-suffering. One commentator said this, true love reveals itself in loving the unlovable, for this is what God does. He shows us his love in the death of his son while we were still in sin. God always comes to us first in love before we come to him in repentance and faith. This is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And that is from 1 John chapter 4. And thus, we also have in the gospel, Jesus' command to love one another. Love is patient and long-suffering. Love is also kind. So when we talk about kind, you know, in our mind, in our culture, we think, well, that's being nice, isn't it? To be kind is to be nice. But there's much more to that. And so how do we describe what the kindness is? And I actually thought, going back to our study in Ruth, about a year ago, we did a, uh, a series in Ruth. And so I want to go there because I think we're going to get a better idea of what kindness is. Ruth chapter 2, verse 20. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. There's that word kindness. Now, if you were here last year and you remember it all, that word kindness is actually a very specific word. And that word is called hesed. It's used over 250 times in the Old Testament. It is a very important word. 
it expresses an essential part of God's nature. Remember, the, the title today is Essentials. This Hesed expresses an essential aspect of God's nature. Now, it can be translated a number of ways. It's a very, very hard word to translate. It can be translated as kindness, loving kindness, or mercy, compassion, grace, love, and faithfulness. It also has a sense of loyalty with it. When God appeared to Moses and he gave the law a second time, uh, it was a very important aspect of what the Lord said. This is from Exodus chapter 34. The Lord passed before him, that's Moses, the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin. That steadfast love, that's the hesed, that's the kindness that we're talking about. And that phrase for a thousand generations isn't meant to, to be an actual number. It's just meant to be so large that his forgiving, his steadfast love, is forever. That's also why we sang that song this morning, forever. And you find that within the Psalms. Psalm 118, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. His hesed, his kindness endures forever. So if you really think about it, God's loving kindness or mercy, compassion, grace, and love and faithfulness does for people what they can't do for themselves. And isn't that kindness doing something for someone else that they cannot do themselves? So when we say Love is patient and kind. It has a depth and a breadth to it that we usually just gloss over. That's the type of love that we are to have. Now, if we, st <laughs> if we stopped right here today and said, that's it, right? Work on being loving in that patience and kindness that we talked, wouldn't that be enough? I don't know about you, but that'd be enough for a lifetime, and it is enough for a lifetime for me. But God knows that we look for loopholes, like how we twist the Sabbath blessing. We look for loopholes. And so we're all not only given the positives, we're given things not to do either. As a matter of fact, by the way, he knows our nature so well, he's given us more not to do's than to do's. Because we're just like kids. Well, you didn't say, but he did say. This is what he said Love does not envy or boast, it is not arrogant or rude, it does not insist on its own way, it is not irritable or resentful. Now, I'm not going to go into all of these, we could. But they're there. If you find yourself doing these things, remember the first two. It's almost like gospel and law. The first two are gospel. These are the law. I think they're pretty straightforward. But I do want to go into two of them, two verses, verses 6 and 7, and I want to clarify some things. Verse 6 says, It does not rejoice at wrongdoings, but rejoices with the truth. The better sense of that word, wrongdoings, is unrighteousness. So let me lay it out this way. Love does not rejoice when sin is glorified and uplifted. When evil is called good and good is called evil. Love does not rejoice in that. What does love rejoice? Love rejoices in the truth. So what is that? Love rejoices when God's word is heard and received. Love rejoices when people come to the saving truth, T, capital T, truth of Jesus. Love 
rejoices when God is glorified. So verse 7, clarify this. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now we've talked about love being long-suffering. So love bears all things and endures all things. We kind of understand that. But what about this believes all things, hopes all things? Well, when it says love believes all things, it doesn't mean that love is gullible. As a matter of fact, as followers of Christ, we are to be discerning. And if you need any reinforcement on that, just go back to the series that we did in 2 Timothy or 1 John. We are to test the spirits. So we are to be discerning. So what does it mean then when it says, believes all things? Love believes in the word of God and the promises that we are given. Love holds on to the promises of God and believes in Jesus Christ, his death, and his resurrection. As a matter of fact, you probably know this verse well too. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asked this question, do you believe this? That's the question. Love believes that. And our hope is in that. So hope. Hope is different than just a wish. A lot of people who are not Christians think we just have a wishful faith. But hope does not mean that. Hope is the confidence that he who has begun a good work will carry it through to the end. Our hope that we have is not a flimsy, whimsy hope. It is the sure confidence in him who has begun the good work, who will finish it. There's a couple of references that I put up there. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. Having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which you, he has called you? What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Hebrews 6.19 We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. And Hebrews 10.23 Let us hold fast the confessions of our hope without wavering, for he who is promised is faithful. See, we have a hope in Christ Jesus that is sure and that is permanent because love is permanent. Let's talk about that. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. You know, there are a lot of people who uh, want to live on forever. And they build great monuments to themselves, right? In our day and age, they have buildings that are named after themselves. But back in the old days, right, the Egyptians built the pyramids, and the pyramid still stands. Name one pyramid that is for an Egyptian king. Any? Any Egyptian pharaohs that come to mind? King Tut, right? King Tut. And so that's one, we remember it, but do you know that's not even his full name? His full name is Tutankhamun. Common. Tutankhamun. It's Egyptian, so that sounds good to me. Tutankhamun. I mean, we don't even remember his full name, right? How about uh, Caesar? Well, we've got a salad dressing named after him and a salad, right? But Julius Caesar, are, well, but Caesar's just a title, so are you talking about Julius Caesar or somebody else? We, are, we don't know. And what else can you tell about Julius Caesar other than, you know, there's a salad that we have? Or Genghis Khan. I mean, he had a huge wide empire. How many people know anything about Genghis Khan? I mean, these were people who ruled the earth, and very little has been left. It's 
not really permanent, isn't it? Even Solomon, Solomon who had wealth, and it was estimated that he had about $2 trillion of wealth. Right? Even if you cut that in half, still a trillion dollars in wealth. And he looked at all of his wealth and he said, oh, that's all vanity too. That's a striving, a chasing after the wind. So what is permanent? I mean, the prophecies, speaking in tongues, knowledge. What's permanent? Love. Love is permanent. Now, how can you say that love is permanent? Right? How can you say, what well, is because God is love? And God is enduring. He is eternal. And thus, love is enduring. Love is eternal. Thus, love, and this should give you comfort, love never fades away. Everything else that we hold on to in this life fades away. Everything fades away. And we try to grasp it more and more, and the more we try to grasp it, the more we realize that it too is going to fade away. But when you are in the presence of God, you are in the presence of His love. His love being perfect and complete. And even the faith and hope that you have will fade away. Now, hold on. We just talked about how important faith and, and, and hope is, right? We, we've been talking about that. How can faith and hope fade away? Because when you are in the very presence of God in the heavens around his throne, is there any more need for hope? No. It's made complete in him. Is there any more need for faith? No. You are fully in his presence. Thus, Love being the greatest. So now faith, hope, and love abide, but these three. But the greatest of these is love. Love endures forever. And that also should give you great comfort. So if his love endures forever, you and I should be maturing in his love as we grow in our faith. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Okay. I'm going to guess if we reminisced and you look back at your youth, there might have been one or two things, maybe, that you regret that were foolish. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to show up, do a show of hands here. But, but, you, but you get that. You, and you sitting at home, right? If you're there, there are things that we have done in our life. I look back and I think, oh, only for the grace of God am I still alive. Only for the grace of God and his love have I been able to live and even have my faith. And so I have grown in my understanding of God's love. I have grown in wisdom. Not my wisdom, but godly wisdom. And so I have matured, and now because of where I am now, I look back on those days and I think, oh, if I could only have told you back then what I know now, right? And so we are all to progress. Does that mean we are perfected here now on this side? No. There's still always, always things to learn to mature in love. And that's what we're supposed to do. To follow his example. To be a disciple of Christ Jesus. He said this, a new commandment I give you. That you love one another just as I have loved you you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's the depth and breadth 
The love is patient, love is kind, the depth and breadth, that's the love, the agape love we are to have. So for you this week, think about this. How have you grown in your love for Jesus and for others? Not just knowledge, but your love, which is expressed in action, by the way, right? How do you need to grow in your love for Jesus and for others? And in what ways do you practice agape love? Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your love. We pray for the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives to lead us, to guide us, to correct us so that we grow not only in your grace and mercy, but in your love. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.